This is America's secret weapon for when diplomacy fails, known as the Gerald R. Ford. This aircraft carrier is the largest and most advanced ship produced by the United States, and by extension, the world. With the ability to bring to bear more firepower than most countries have in their entire air force, the Ford is the most fearsome ship prowling the world's oceans. However, there is just one problem. Due to some fatal design flaws, the flagship technologies that make it unique are still not up to snuff yet. But why would the Navy invest so much in broken equipment? And, more importantly, what is being done to fix it? At the heart of the Ford aircraft carrier's combat power is the ability to launch, recover, rearm, and refuel each of the roughly 90 fixed and rotary wing aircraft embarked on board. This process, known as cyclic flight ops, is the main way America's Navy projects power abroad, and for good reason. With a fully manned, trained, and equipped crew, an aircraft carrier can conduct sustained 24-hour flight operations for sometimes months on end. And for those who think this is not possible, ships like the USS Theodore Roosevelt did just that during the opening stages of Operation Enduring Freedom, where she operated independently for just over five months without resupply. With the ability to project power several thousand miles away, the capability and sheer amount of weaponry a fully equipped air detachment can bring to the fight cannot be understated. In fact, just one American aircraft carrier has more aircraft than about half of the world's total air forces. But getting this aircraft up and off the flight deck is a challenging task. To accomplish the mission of cyclic flight ops, there are really three main pieces of technology that get the job done. The first of these are the weapons elevators. Weapons elevators are important since aircraft bombs are only assembled once they're needed for a mission. Waiting to assemble them reduces the risk of storing armed bombs in magazines on board. On U.S. aircraft carriers, there's a place called the Bomb Farm deep inside the skin of the ship where sailors assemble the bombs and missiles. Once assembled, the sailors use weapons elevators to ferry the ordnance to the flight deck. After sailors topside rearm and refuel the aircraft, the pilot then takes off for their next mission. However, no Navy aircraft can generate enough thrust to get itself off the deck and into the air under its own power. So what gives pilots this helping hand? Known as a catapult, this is one of the ship's most vital pieces of gear. The way it works is steam generated from the ship's nuclear reactor is fed into a system that builds up a tremendous amount of energy. The crew then launches the aircraft as the pilot accelerates to get off deck. But what about landing? American and most foreign aircraft carriers have arresting gears on the deck. These arresting gears work by having a cable laid across the deck. As the pilot nears the flight deck for a landing, they lower their tail hook in the back of the plane. As the aircraft makes contact with the deck, the goal is to hook the cable. When this happens, there's a pulley system that connects to what is called an engine. The engine is a hydraulic system that helps absorb the shock and stop the aircraft at a short distance. The three-tiered system, as described, has been in use by the U.S. Navy since World War II. But why would the Navy want to change something that has clearly been working for generations? One of the most significant issues with all three pieces of equipment is time. Electrohydraulic elevators can be very slow. Additionally, each time an aircraft lands, the crew must set the parameters for the arresting gear for each aircraft type. Both of these actions can slow down aircraft launching and recovery. Another reason the Navy wants to change things up is that the catapult puts a lot of stress on the airframes. Because each aircraft gets a massive jolt of energy and not at a gradual buildup, these forces can wreak havoc on an airframe's integrity over time. Additionally, with each aircraft weighing a different weight, adjusting the catapult for each plane can be more of an art than a science. For these reasons, the Navy wanted to make things faster and cause less stress on the aircraft, which means less maintenance and overhaul in the future, not to mention cost savings. But what kind of technologies did the Navy use on the Ford-class carriers? Among the 23 different technologies Ford hosts as new and innovative, 
Chief among them is what is known as the Electromagnetic Aircraft Launching System, or EMALS for short. EMALS is a revolutionary system and the first of its kind in the world. While legacy catapult systems rely on steam to propel aircraft, EMALS uses electricity and magnets. But how? When an aircraft is getting ready to be launched, the EMALS system can sense its exact weight. Using software programs, EMALS can calculate exactly how much force is necessary to launch the plane. This is physically done by passing electricity through a series of magnets on the deck. But what benefit does this give the Navy? The most obvious benefit is that each aircraft gets a tailored launch force, which, compared to the legacy catapult system, is like a gentle acceleration instead of being punched at full force. Additionally, with thousands of feet less of steam and hydraulic piping, the EMALS, in theory, should be much easier to maintain and correct if problems arise. But where is all this power coming from? Like its predecessors, the Ford is a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier. At the heart of the propulsion plant is a nuclear reactor generating steam that helps spin turbines that provide thrust and generate electric power for the ship. But unlike its predecessors, the Ford's nuclear reactor produces about 30% more power and is much more efficient than previous reactors. But why? Because the carrier uses EMALS to launch and recover aircraft, there are absolutely huge amounts of electricity at play here. Legacy reactors could not meet the power demands of EMALS, and that would be a bad day for getting aircraft off in a timely fashion. Besides the new catapult, the Ford also has a new arresting gear system. Known as Advanced Arresting Gear, or AAG, the Ford has revolutionized how aircraft can stop. While legacy systems used hydraulics that had to be set each time, the AAG can automatically adjust for the weight of each incoming aircraft. It does this through the use of what are called water twisters. The water twisters do exactly that. Large steel plates inside drums of water make up the engine and adjust the forces necessary to slow the plane. By using AAGs, aircraft also get a more tailored recovery while being able to reset faster and needing less maintenance than leaky hydraulic systems. But these are not the only advanced technologies. The Ford also hosts a slew of never-before-seen systems, such as dual-band radar, combat system suites, and more. While systems like the dual-band radar and others have had their own unique trials and tribulations, the issues with EMALS and AAG really affect the Ford's ability to launch and recover aircraft. So what is exactly wrong with them? While the exact problems plaguing the Ford remain classified, a recently published report from the Director of the Department of Defense's Operational Test and Evaluation Division shed some light on both EMALS and AAG's continuing issues. According to the report, both systems are constantly down due to both hardware and software issues. For example, when noting problems with EMALS, the DoD stated that the position block sensors inside the rails of the EMALS system continually fail. These continual failings required the ship to replace all the sensors to continue flight operations. Additionally, some design flaws continued to linger in EMALS. One of these was the lack of an ability to centrally troubleshoot issues. Before, technicians needed to painstakingly trace faults locally until the EMALS manufacturer created and installed a centralized diagnostic system to quickly identify faults. It has yet to be determined how effective that system has been to date. As for the advanced arresting gear, the report noted that despite unspecified hardware and software upgrades to the three AAGs currently installed, there has been little improvement in reliability since the program's inception. Additionally, there remain questions as to why the Navy has not yet installed the fourth AAG engine. Initially, this had not been done as a cost-saving measure. However, the Ford remains the only aircraft carrier in service with three arresting gear engines and not four. Adding a fourth engine would greatly help redundancy to keep flight operations going. But the report is not all doom and gloom. It has a few high points, most notably the number of flight operations the Ford has carried out in the past year. During 2023, when the Ford completed its first actual deployment of around eight months, the crew conducted 9,266 arrested landings. 
this figure is almost equal to the total number of all arrested landings completed in the five years of service before that deployment of 10,826 arrested landings. So, what is the future of the Ford in the American fleet? Fortunately for the Ford, U.S. law actually prohibits the Navy from maintaining less than 11 aircraft carriers at any time. Because of this, the ship itself, despite its issues, will not be going anywhere anytime soon. However, the problems that have been reported in the past still appear to be lingering. Though the number of launches and recoveries has drastically increased, the Ford-class carrier will not live up to its full potential until the manufacturers fix systematic hardware and software issues with EMALs and the AAGs and teach the crew how to conduct critical repairs without contractor support. Bye for now.